Hello there and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen this is L24 daily special coverage and today's I will be on the Ukraine Russia conflict as firefighters race to pull people from the rubble and flames it helped the night sky president Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine denounce a Russian missile strike on a residential neighborhood in Kharkiv on Wednesday on Wednesday night as vile and cynical attack on civilians the attack he said was the latest evidence that russia struggling on battlefield in the east and the south of the country was targeting civilians to advance its ultimate goal of destroying the ukraine state ukrainian officials said at least seven civilians were killed and another 16 wounded including 11 years old child on the other side the rockets arrived almost every day from the direction of sprawling Zaporizhia nuclear power plant just across the Dnieper River from Nikopolu. The Russian forces that have occupied the plant since March have effectively turned it into a fortress. There have been large explosions on the premises of the plant. However, someone is firing and each side blames the other one and the United Nations officials have raised alarms and concerns warning over possible nuclear accidents. To analyze all this information, I'm joined live by Mr. Lakvinder Singh, serving as Director of Peace Program of the Asia Institute from South Korea, and Gregory Simons, an associate professor with IRS Uppsala University from Sweden, alongside Benjamin Blandin, strategic consultant in the aerospace and uh, the defense industry from France. And he is now located in Malaysia. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us in this debate. A short break and we will be back. And so before we start our debate, let me read for you this uh, piece of information. Accusations continue between Ukraine and Russia over the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The two countries are pointing fingers at each other for provoking a nuclear crisis by bombing the plant, which can lead to an undesired escalation that can put the world in trouble. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has affirmed that his country will have joint operation with International Atomic Energy Agency to guarantee transparency of the situation. On August 19th, Kiev's regime is preparing a resonant provocation at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant during the General Secretary Antonio Guterres' visit to Ukraine, as a result of which Russia will be accused of creating a man-made catastrophe at this power plant. Ukrainian diplomats are nuclear scientists and the International Atomic Energy Agency mission to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Only absolute transparency and controllability of the situation at and around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant for the Ukrainian state, for the international community and for the International Atomic Energy Agency can guarantee a gradual return to the normal nuclear safety. So. We will be starting with Mr. Benjamin since this is the first intervention with us. Mr. Benjamin, on Monday, Russia has been called by more than 42 countries to withdraw its troops from the nuclear plant Zaborucha. So, how can you explain these calls? Though, one of the main reasons why Russia launched this military operation for the first place is to put hand on these nuclear plants. Well, uh, first of all, I would say that uh, indeed Russia had uh, obviously the intention of controlling parts of the Ukrainian territory, but at least they could have avoided to place military units and especially artillery units from the in the perimeter of the central of the power plant, sorry. And they could have also avoided launching attacks on Ukrainian troops from the perimeter of this nuclear power plant. So, um, of course, it's, it's obviously dangerous for the Ukrainian side to counter-strike in this perimeter. But I would like to balance uh, some uh, uh, 
uh, very uh, terrible analysis from certain media who say that there is a, an immediate uh, danger of explosion because obviously uh, strikes are being uh, uh, done in the in the perimeter. Yes, but uh, uh, you have been able to witness that first they are using quite high precision munitions and they are, they are targeting rather the external perimeter or the fringes of the perimeter. So I wouldn't say currently there is a, a major risk, but of course uh, it would be rather better for both sides to disengage from the power plant. Mm -hmm. Perfectly understood. Uh, Mr. Simons, how can you explain the continuous shelling of Azerbaijan nuclear plants? Why no one, neither Russia nor Ukraine, are thinking of the world's safety? Europe already witnessed the catastrophic disaster of Chernobyl in 1986. Why they keep escalating the situation over that? Who can hold them responsible for these actions? Well, if we were to look at this as a sort of crime, Crime is driven by motivation plus opportunity. So the opportunity is to make something newsworthy uh, because it's very fearful. It's very uh, prominent news story. It gets people's attention. But what is the motivation? And the motivation, especially if we look at Ukraine, they're losing the war. And people, that is the public in the West, are starting to tire of the war. The tiring of the consequences for the government supporting the Ukrainian war effort. So this, I mean, war is primarily driven by politics. So this is attempting to create politics that gov these Western governments and Western publics continue to support Ukraine because they're at a critical and desperate situation. They're clearly losing the war and they're clearly losing public support and interest. Mm -hmm. Perfectly, Anderson. Coming to you, Mr. Mr. Singh. Do you hear me, Mr. Singh? Mr. Singh, Antonio Guterres, UN uh, General Secretary, kept warning the world leaders to avoid any escalation forward that lead to nuclear use of weapons. So, do you really think we have reached this point of tension and a nuclear shot? would be used. And don't you think there is a link with what is happening around the globe in Ukraine precisely and what have been found, as rumors mentioned, classified documents related to nuclear weapons in the U.S. former president, Mar Lago, Donald Trump? First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, no, I don't think so that the world has reached a point where nuclear uh, weapons can be used. I think... Uh, uh, Russia is a very mature nuclear power, and they fully understand the consequence of using uh, nuclear uh, weapons at this stage. So I think, uh, but I do agree with the fear that the possible uh, use of nuclear weapons is possible in, in case of accident. So, but I'm fully hopeful that uh, we have not reached that stage. Just to some extent, I see what is happening in the world, and uh, what is happening in Marilogo is also connected with the Ukraine war. But I feel that uh, we have not reached that point. Escalation is not that level that nuclear power will be used now at this stage. So we are fully, I think, having safe. Mm -hmm. Perfectly understood. Uh, coming to you before moving to another point, Mr. Uh, Benjamin, what is the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency toward the nuclear crisis right now happening? What they can do to fix the situation over there? I think that regarding the, the tensions, uh, military of course, but also political uh, tensions between Russia and uh, Ukraine, uh, I think IAEA could really play a good uh, a role, sorry, of uh, um, of intermediate of trust between the two parties in order specifically uh, to demilitarize the perimeter uh, around the Borussia nuclear power plant. The, the, the same way they they, act, they acted between the U.S. and Iran, and uh, in some other instances. So I, I really feel that they should not waste any time to to play that role. Mm -hmm. Okay, got the idea. Now moving on to discuss another point. Uh, the, a South Korean defense ministry official said neighboring North Korea fired two cruise missiles early Wednesday. 
morning from the coastal town of Onchon into waters of its west coast. The latest launch comes as South Korean President Yoon suk yeol called for diplomacy aimed at building sustainable peace between the rivals amid tensions over the North's acceleration weapons program. So since you are in uh, South Korea, I'll be stating this uh, question with you. Recently, Putin sent a letter to North Korea's leader calling for a strong, close, better relations. So what is your reading to this close tie between Moscow and North Korea and to which side it is counted? And is South Korea under the threat right now? I think uh, this is a very good opportunity for both countries to strengthen their relations. As you know, after the end of the Cold War, the relationship between North Korea and Russia was a little weakened. But now both of them are finding it very useful, you know. Uh, North Korea was looking for the opportunity to break the sanctions imposed by the Western world. And uh, recently, both Russia and China refused to support a sanction regime on uh, North Korea, even though uh, North Korea keep uh, testing nuclear uh, missiles, you know. So I think uh, this is a very good opportunity for both countries to strengthen the relationship. North Korea is looking for an opportunity to, to engage in our Ukraine war. You know, as you know, they, they recently offered uh, to send their soldiers or uh, even construction workers to support Russian war effort. I think uh, this is a very good signal for both countries to strengthen their relationship. I think both are looking for opportunity. I think the Russians understand the geopolitical value of engaging North Korea in the Ukraine war. So I think uh, maybe they are serious this time that they may involve North Korea in the Ukraine war in the, in the coming, coming weeks. Mm -hmm. Question understood. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Benjamin, don't you think the latest visit of Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan pushed Russia to speed up its spreading movement in the Asian continent, first Iran and now North Korea? Well, first, uh, I believe that uh, it was an opportunity for Russia to demonstrate the close ties with China, like being in support to, to China is the same way China has been a moral support to Russia. So this was the first opportunity. And uh, after that, I think uh, um, we have noticed that uh, the close ties between Russia and India, the Russia and Vietnam and some other countries. So yes, for Russia, on many aspects, it's a good occasion to go back uh, and to um, to show that it's uh, not only focused on what's happening in Ukraine and uh, Eastern Europe, but that is that it also has an agenda for the world and specifically for Asia. Mm -hmm. Very good indeed. Uh, derived from your words, Mr. Simon, don't you think now after Iran gets close to Russia, European Union and U.S. are looking forward for a fresh negotiation with Iran over the 2015 nuclear deal? It is. Uh, don't you think uh, it, it is a sort of dangerous concern that Moscow could gain another strong ally in the region, or they only want to fulfill Iran's request to bring it to their side, the Western Bloc? Well, unfortunately, this is presuming that the West still act rationally and in its own interest, which, if anything, recent events this year have proven they do anything but act in their own interest. They still believe that they're an uncontested hegemony uh, in the globe and can, uh, can dictate uh, all matters. I mean, what Taiwan, what the JCPOA uh, and what Ukraine have all proven is that they no longer have that same coercive force that they did have uh, in the immediate aftermath of the old Cold War. Mm -hmm. Quite understood. Uh, another point to be discussed coming back to Ukraine, uh, and spokesperson stated, UN spokesperson stated that UN Secretary General Antony Guterres will meet Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan in Ukraine on Thursday. As an end on Friday, they will visit the Black Sea port of Odessa, where grain exports have resumed under UN uh, broker deal. At the invitation of President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine, uh, the Secretary General will be in Lviv on Thursday to attend a trilateral meeting with President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey and the Ukrainian leader. The Secretary General will then go on to Odessa the next day, where he will visit the port that is one of the three being used as part of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. 
Mr. Simons, uh, coming back to you again, how can you describe the economic situation in Europe after almost seven months of battling? And how this grain shipment will boost the Ukrainian economy to recover? The grain shipments will not boost the Ukrainian economy to recover. I mean, the, the war expenditures and the general state, uh, not only physical but psychological, uh, of the Ukrainian economy means it will be in utter disarray, whatever is left of it. And, I mean, what you're getting here is, I mean, with these visits such as Erdogan, I mean, what this signals is the increasing marginalisation of the, of the uh, West, that is the EU as a kind of vassal, but also the United States, how they're getting sidelined from these uh, major events which, uh, which have been contributing to creating. Mm -hmm. Understood. Uh, as a comment on your statement, uh, Mr. Benjamin, how can these grain shipments prove the Ukrainian status in this war? And can we consider these successful grain shipments as a step forward to reach an end in this conflict between Ukraine and Russia? Well, since the signing of the agreement for exploitation, uh, I think back in 27 of July, uh, there has been a total of 25 ships, uh, so it, it, it may seem like a lot, actually it's a really small portion of the, of the usual uh, transport ships. And in fact, uh, I, I think in normal years, uh, the production is 60 million tons of uh, cereals, uh, ma maize and, and some other products. And this year, it should be 30% less than usual. And, and, uh, and so, um, to jump on your first question to Mr. Simon, uh, I would say that the exports, even if they were at 100% of their capacity, it wouldn't uh, have such a big impact on, on the recovery of the economy because the losses have been so great in infrastructures and building and so on. So it's, the more ships there are, the better, of course. Uh, but uh, it, it's really a starting process, and um, and I, I would believe that the uh, visit in Odessa and then in Turkey of uh, Mr. Gutierrez will help uh, speed things up on that regard. Mm -hmm. Perfectly understood. I know that you are in Malaysia, but I'm deadly certain you have an idea about the economic situation in France. How can you explain the the, the impact of Ukraine over uh, the economic in France? I mean. I believe there is an inflation over there as well as in U.S. So, what is the situation over there? Well, uh, my answer will be twofold. So, I, exactly, I'm in Malaysia right, right now, and for having uh, I, I've read a lot of articles recently from uh, Pakistan media, Malaysian media, and uh, and Indonesian media, and I can tell you that the impact is really, really important, especially on the poor, uh, on the poorest uh, people, especially for the food and uh, cooking oil is, is one is one important aspect. Uh, in France, in con in contrast, the impact is rather light. Uh, honestly, I haven't seen a, a spike in prices, either for the food or it, it's rather the energy that has been uh, the most important aspect, and uh, especially for the people uh, filling their tanks uh, for the cars. But uh, I, I think in Europe, Western Europe, there, there's been a lot of discussions about it, but I think we are quite protected uh, either by the government or by the mechanics of our economies uh, for the moment. Mm -hmm. Perfectly understood. Thank you so much for this uh, explanation. Mr. Singh, could the incomes from these grain shipments cover the huge debts Ukraine is drawing in? And they are still uh, keep asking for more weapons, for more funding. I mean, how Ukraine will pay the debts they have? I think uh, there's a very little, uh, uh, because this deal is not that big, you know. Uh, I don't think uh, Ukraine can use this uh, the money earned from these exports can to pay its debts. But uh, this uh, deal can uh, play very important role in uh, in uh, bringing peace uh, to the region and to the Ukraine war. And I think uh, Russians also see it as the opportunity to show that they are responsible power, even though they know this deal will strengthen the Korean Ukraine economy and bring money, uh, hard dollars for the uh, Ukraine economy, but still they are allowing it. So it means uh, uh, Russians are opening an opportunity uh, for peace. So I think uh, this uh, uh, deal uh, will play very positive, both for Russians as well as for Ukrainians. But I still 
doubtful that this uh, the grain sales will help uh, Ukraine to lower its uh, debt because uh, that's very different uh, story at, at all together. You know. Thank you so much for this explanation. Coming to you, Mr. Simon, uh, I really wonder what make uh, Turkey valuable and could manage to do the same, this uh, deal. I mean, why there isn't another European country could manage to do what Turkey has done? What is special about Turkey in this situation between Ukraine and Russia? Turkey in this regard, I mean, it's been already for a number of years developing itself in terms of its foreign and security policy as being uh, independent and separate from NATO and this Western line. And what we see here, Turkey has developed yet another strain of its diplomacy where it's acting as a bridge between uh, Western and non-Western countries. And I mean, this is not only referring to what's happening in Ukraine, but I mean, there's also spread their influence to other countries such as Libya, Syria and other parts of the world as well uh, as the South Caucasus. But what they're doing here is they make themselves somewhat valuable and indispensable uh, to the West, especially the United States and Europe, at a time when the United States and Europe are criticising Turkey for different issues, uh, and especially if we're looking at the mass uh, refugee crisis, because now Turkey has created the situation where it will be the West needing Turkey uh, rather than simply being able to use Turkey at moments of convenience. Mm -hmm. Perfectly understood. Thank you so much, Mr. Simon. Uh, before moving on to the, the Chinese troops and uh, the exercise military joints, Mr. Benjamin, there is a question has been raised. Why uh, Macron couldn't manage to do what the Turkish president is doing? Because in the beginning of the war, in March, April, uh, Mr. Macron keep calling uh, Putin and keep uh, making a calls with him, a meeting with him, but he couldn't manage to do what uh, the, the Turkish president has done. What was missing to Macron? Uh, well, uh, indeed, Mr. Macron uh, has been criticized uh, by uh, many in the opposition parties in France and uh, by, by many commentators in the population for his uh, incapacity to reach uh, a, a lasting uh, agreement or even any agreement at all with Mr. Putin, despite numerous discussions uh, on the phone, coming himself to Moscow. And that has been uh, uh, truly uh, troubling to, to certain people. Uh, but um, on that regard, uh, I, I believe me, uh, President Putin also likes to play uh, highs and fire, uh, so to speak, in, in certain circumstances. <laughs> so maybe, maybe President Putin also tried to to raise the bar too high to obtain an agreement, and maybe uh, that's the reason why there was no agreement in the end. Mm -hmm. Perfectly, and so now the last point to be discussed: Chinese troops will travel to Russia to take part in joint military exercises led by the host, and including India, Belarus, Mongolia, Tajikistan, and other countries. According to the Chinese Defense Ministry, China. China's participation in the joint exercise was related to a current international and regional situation. Uh, Mr. Singh, China is moving directly and rapidly to reinforce its bilateral relation with its strategic partner Russia. In a time where all the world leaders are condemning this uh, Putin and the Moscow action in, uh, actions in Ukraine, so in your opinion, what that's supposed to mean? Has Russia, or rather, or rather, has China finally made its choice after the last visit of U.S. delegation to Taiwan and chooses to be a fully ally to Moscow? Answer is no, uh, uh, because China-U.S. relation is very complicated. It's not a one-dimensional relationship; it's a multi-dimensional relationship. Even though strategically, even militarily, China is tilting towards Russia, but uh, China has a very elaborate relationship with U.S. China has a huge trade ties with uh, U.S. as well as with Europe. So it's not a China to move away from this trade relationship or economic relationship. It was cost China too much to take a one-sided decision. I think uh, 
China's uh, economy, China's uh, economic growth depend on its ties with the with the USA. So I think uh, uh, China will think a million times before uh, making this jump. So I think uh, both countries, even China, USA, will not be in a, in a easy position to dump uh, China completely. So even though in the one crisis, there was some deep situation, but both countries understand the economic value of each other. You know, China is very important economic player in the region, very important military player in the region. So it's not easy for uh, for uh, China, for so USA to provoke China to a large extent. I think what's happening is just a strategic placements. They are trying to understand each other's uh, strategies or in each other's mind. But uh, China simply cannot uh, dump uh, uh, its ties with the uh, USA to for Russia. So I think uh, Russia will stay as it is. Mm -hmm. Very good indeed. Coming to you, Mr. Simon, because uh, I have been called and I have been told that you are leaving. Mr. Simons, don't you think it's really strange that USA helped and pushed China and Russia toward these strong ties? Why would they push these two world giants to their limits? Is US capable of facing both countries gathered? Well, the US is finished as a hegemony. I mean, even Kissinger has recently uh, expressed his dismay at what he calls a disequilibrium, which is in play at the moment. I mean, the keeping Russia or the Soviet Union as it was in China separated was a central point of US policy from the 1970s. So, uh, I mean, now that they've pushed it together, I mean, it, it shows th this rather rash and suicidal approach by the US-led West to international relations, which, if anything, is merely going to accelerate this transformation from this Western-centric U.S. Uh, unipolar world towards a non-Western-centric multipolar world. Mm -hmm. Very good indeed. Uh, Mr. Simon, thank you so much for taking part with us in this debate. Um, I'm sure that you have things to do. Thank you so much. Coming to you, Mr. Benjamin, uh, as a last word, or rather as last question, what is the status of Malaysia in the, the continents, in the Asian continents, uh, concerning Russia as well as Ukraine. I mean, you are there. Probably you have a better idea than ours. Mr. Benjamin, do you hear me? Well, uh, I, in fact, I arrived in Malaysia two days ago, and uh, so I wouldn't call myself the first big person of Malaysia. Uh, but uh, here, uh, a specificity of uh, Malaysian politics is uh, not to show off their opinion uh, directly. They, they rather uh, prefer to to have uh, behind closed doors discussions. And a, a good example is the South China Sea issue. I'm not going to enter in, in that topic, but uh, uh, you may have seen that they, they rather prefer to discuss with China privately, and it's the same with the situation in Ukraine, and, and uh, I wouldn't say ties between Malaysia and Russia are very important, and the same goes with Ukraine, so it's, uh, it's, it's not really important uh, here. A good point has been taken. Mr. Singh, as a last word, India also has taken part in these uh, drills and in this exercise. What that represents to the Western world? Is India taking a part with this? India is, uh, is taking a separate road than uh, his friends because we are strongly believed in multilateralism. We don't want to take sides in this conflict and we strongly believe that all countries should work together. So Ukraine war is very uh, dangerous dilemma for uh, for India and we think that if not properly managed, it can lead to major conflict in the region. So we are, as a responsible power, we are doing our best to maintain peace and not to provoke war. So we are having very good relations with USA as well as with Russia as well as China. So we are playing a very constructive and a positive role to contain the conflict as much as possible. So by going to this uh, exercise, we are showing that we are with China, with Russia, as well as we are doing exercises with USA in India. So it means that we are not trying to divide. We are trying to unite both, both the parties together so that peace prevails and progress continues. Mm -hmm. Very good indeed. Mr. Benjamin, a couple minutes left. So the word is yours and the floor is yours. What is your expectation in the coming months in the war between Ukraine and Russia? Well, it has been said by many commentators in Western Europe that uh, 
the moment of balance uh, uh, would, would happen in the month of August. Uh, what I mean by that is whether we would see in August whether the conflict goes in favor of Ukraine or in favor of Russia. Uh, what, is, uh, what is obvious to see is that uh, deliveries of uh, very high precision weapons from the US and some other countries uh, has been very important uh, over the months of July and August. And we've seen, as a result, a multiple explosion of ammunition dumps and uh, other strategic locations in uh, Russian-occupied Ukraine and in Crimea. And uh, I would say that uh, a lot will depend on the capacity of both sides uh, either to be Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Benjamin. Point has been taken. Thank you ever so much for your participation. Mr. Singh as well. Thank you ever so much for always taking part with us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us in this special coverage. A special coverage will be also had tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.